Just a day or two ago, we talked about the Antonuk versus New York State case, where the gun owners of America helped bring a lawsuit challenging all sorts of the new anti-gun gun control laws uh, passed by the New York State Legislature. And in that opinion, the federal district court judge in the Northern District of New York wrote a very powerful opinion in favor of gun rights and against these gun control laws, which was great. However, the bad news is that this judge ruled against the plaintiffs on what's known as standing. We have received a lot of questions about what is standing and how does this get in the way of gun rights? Well, I'm gonna give you a quick video explaining what it is. Hey folks, I'm Mark Smith, host of The Four Boxes, diner, proud American gun owner, best-selling author, constitutional attorney, and member of the United States Supreme Court Bar. If you haven't subscribed to The Four Boxes, diner, second amendment channel, please do so and show your love for the right to keep and bear arms. Okay, in the Anton Young case versus New York State, which we talked about a day or two ago, we know that the federal district court judge came out with very favorable rulings in favor of gun rights in the Second Amendment and would have struck, struck down much of many of these new gun control laws that New York just passed through the legislature. However, the judge refused to do so on the grounds that the plaintiffs in that case lacked what is known as standing. Well, obviously, you need to know what standing is to fully comprehend this case. Although the reality is it's not something in the Second Amendment community you need to know a lot about other than your lawyers need to know about this. But I do want to give you a little bit of background of what it means just so you have a general understanding of standing so if you see the word, you know the context. So, let's begin. To begin with, there are two types of courts in America. There's state courts and federal courts. Most challenges to constitutional laws under the Federal Bill of Rights, including the Second Amendment, which is part of the Federal Bill of Rights, occur in federal courts. Federal courts exist by virtue of the existence of the United States Constitution. In the United States Constitution, Article I created the Congress, Article II of the Constitution creates the presidency, and Article III of the Constitution creates the court system. The highest court in the land under Article III of the United States Constitution is, of course, the, is the Supreme Court, which we all know about the Supreme Court, and also it gives Congress the authority to create what are known as inferior courts, meaning they are below the Supreme Court. And that's what Congress, of course, has done. They've created a federal court system below the United States Supreme Court. Now, Article 3 doesn't just talk about what courts can exist under federal law and under the Constitution. It also goes on to talk about the jurisdiction of the federal courts. And in that discussion in Article 3 of the U.S. Constitution, it talks about what are known as cases and controversies. Specifically, this, the Constitution says that federal courts may hear what are known as cases or controversies. Well, what are those? Well, what the, what the Constitution was getting at is they wanted to make sure that the court system would only address cases where there was a legitimate actual dispute between parties. I really disagree with Joe about a case and what's going on here. And Joe disagrees with me. And, and it's a legitimate actual dispute that's going to matter in the real world. And, and therefore, we can sue each other in federal court. What the Constitution and Founding Fathers did not want to occur was for Mark and Joe to have a fight about who's the better baseball team, uh, the Seattle Mariners or the Boston Red Sox. And they didn't want us to be able to go to court and fight about trivial things like this. So basically, a, a case can only go to federal court if it's a case or conflict. Controversy. Now, over the years, the definition of what is a case or controversy and how one arises and what is a real case or controversy has been the subject of much litigation. And one of the critical elements to an actual case or controversy, I mean, you have a real fight, a real legal fight that's going to make a difference in American life or American law is the notion of standing. And what standing is, is that the plaintiff or plaintiffs who sue in federal court for a constitutional violation have to have standing. And really all standing means at the end of the day is the plaintiff has some sort of personal stake 
in the outcome of the case, something directly attributable or directly to him, not generically. In other words, I can't just say, hey, I care about the Iraq war. I want a sue to stop it or I want a sue to commence it. I'm a general taxpayer. No, general understanders or general concerns about public policy matters is not enough to get standing. You have to be personally impacted by some unconstitutional thing to have standing to sue in federal court. So the three components of standing is that you have to have an injury, that's attributable to the alleged constitutional violation. It has to be traceable, meaning connected to who you sue. So I may feel my Second Amendment, Amendment rights are being violated by the governor of New York. That doesn't allow me to sue like the governor of Boston. I have to sue the defendant that's actually directly hurting me in some way. So therefore, I as the plaintiff might sue, you know, the, the law enforcement agencies in New York or the governor of New York or whoever is responsible for effectuating change uh, involving the constitutional violation of the Second Amendment. And of course, last but not least, um, the issue has to be addressed, something that can be addressed in federal court, which obviously Second Amendment issues uh, are addressable in federal court. Now, the general way to think about a Second Amendment claim goes like this when it comes to standing, that I used to have a gun that was an AR-15, or I used to be able to go on the subway with my firearm. They just passed a law that banned my AR-15, which I own, or now I'm no longer able to go on the subway with my gun because they just prevented me from doing so legally. And I think these are violations of the Second Amendment. So I've been directly impacted because I've, you know, now I've lost my AR-15 or now I can't carry a gun on the subway. Uh, I sue the state of New York or whoever's involved with the state of New York enforcing the laws because obviously they're the ones enforcing it. I can't sue, again, the New York Yankees baseball team or I can't sue some random person in California. If I'm in New York, I have to sue the relevant person in New York that's responsible for enforcing the law against me. And last but not least, of course, it has to be something that federal courts are willing to entertain. And of course, we know that federal courts are happy to entertain constitutional dis debates over the Second Amendment, so it's a pretty clear. So that's the basic way to understand standing. Now, what happened in the Anatuck case is a little bit odd because the court seemed to set up an unrealistically high standard to meet for standing. So it seems like this court got standing wrong, which is why I think the judge realized he may have got it wrong, which is why he decided the rest of the case, giving the plaintiffs the opportunity, presumably, to appeal to the Second Circuit Court of Appeals to apply what I think will probably be the proper standard for standing, which is much more loose and much more forgiving, and much easier to meet than the standard that the judge in the Antonyuk case uh, set forth. Now the, okay. now, the most perplexing decision of the judge in the Antioch case involved his claim and his opinion that the plaintiff who was a lawful concealed carry holder was uh, did not have standing to challenge the sensitive places, restricted places requirements of where you can work and where you can't go with your gun and where you can go with your gun. Um, I don't understand, frankly, how the judge concluded that this plaintiff lacked standing to sue um, as all he had to really is testify is that I would be willing to go to these places. I'd like to go to these places, but I'm not going to go into these places because if I go into these places, I'll be a felon and I don't want to become a felon. So therefore, um, I want these struck down so I can lawfully take my gun into the store or I can lawfully take my gun on the subway, whatever it happens to be. Now, the court said that was not enough, that, the, that somehow the court actually articulated the view that the plaintiff had to show an intent to violate these laws, but there's several Supreme Court cases that say clearly that to get standing in federal court on a constitutional matter, you don't actually have to say you're going to violate the law and become a criminal. You don't have to go that far to get standing. So I don't know why this judge decided what he did. It seems like he got that part of the standing analysis wrong. I should say that standing analysis can be tricky and judges sometimes do get it wrong. But it seems like this was, at least with respect to the plaintiff suing over sensitive places, should have been pretty straightforward. I just want to bring to everyone's attention two Supreme Court cases that should not have been overlooked by the federal court um, and by the people involved. I'm not sure if these were cited or not or if they were read carefully. But if you look at the case of TransUnion LLC versus Ramirez, which is a 2021 Supreme Court case, um, it specifically says that the plaintiff does not have to put himself or herself in legal jeopardy in order to have standing. 
they don't have to risk going to jail in order to have standing. It's a much lower standard to meet for a plaintiff than that. Uh, in that particular case, the Supreme Court just said that all you need to do is to show the threat of state law is going to apply to you and what you want to do, and that gives you standing. And so here in the Anthony Young case, the plaintiff presumably would have testified or would have said that I want to carry my gun all around the state of New York, um, and I would do so if these laws were not applicable to me. And that probably should have given them standing, so I don't quite understand why standing was not met there. The other relevant case is a case involving Ted Cruz. Cruz, that's the Federal Election Commission versus Ted Cruz case before the United States Supreme Court in 2022, just this year. In that, the Supreme Court says, we have made it clear that an injury resulting from the application or threatened application of an unforceable, unforced, uh, uh, unlawful, I should say, unlawful enactment remains fairly traceable to such application, even if the injury could be described in some sense as willingly occurred. So basically what it's saying is the plaintiff does not need to actually take the violative action. He doesn't have to violate the law in order to have standing. He can just say, I intend to violate the law or I'm going to violate the law or I don't want to violate the law, but if to do what I want to do, I'm going to violate the law. That should be adequate to get standing in federal court. So again, I am a little perplexed why the anti-yuck case um, was dismissed on standing grounds. But again, um, you know, that's at the end of the day, up to the lawyers litigating the case to figure all that out because they know their clients. They know the facts of the case. They're there at the hearings. They're there at the trials. Uh, they know how what they've alleged and what the defendants are saying. So it's all very fact specific. But it does see in the anti-yuck case, standing looks like it was satisfied and we'll see whether or not an appeal is taken to the second circuit court of appeals and if it is that will be very interesting because if standing is then determined to be yes there is standing then the question is will the second amend uh, will the second circuit court of appeals which is the federal appellate court in new york will they affirm and decide that yes indeed all of these various new york laws violate the second amendment just like the lower court found I suspect that that's exactly what they'll find, but only time will tell. Okay, I hope you learned something here today. If you haven't subscribed, please do so. We'll see you again here at the 4 Boxes Diner. Orders up. Table 2A.